uh, Quinn, uh, who joins newly. Um, hi, Manuel. And uh, he actually has a background uh, philosophy and ethical thinking. Uh, it was a contact through Zargam. Quickly, hey everyone. And um, I would say, uh, Quinn, if you share a bit about uh, your background um, and also, you know, uh, your research, I shared it uh, in the channel. I don't know if uh, people had time to go. look into it, mm, but it would be great. And then basically I'd like us to... Uh, go over our um, mirror board with the um, insights or with the things we collected from last time and basically work on those, um, how do you call it, patterns that we see and, and crystallize them a bit and would be great to have uh, everyone's input and uh, quest um, insights, uh, but also like Quinn, um, how you see it from more with the ethics uh, lens and how we should go about um, maybe structuring the next focus group calls would be great. Do you want me to do a little introduction for myself now? Yes, please, yeah. a short okay. intro. All right, absolutely. Uh, nice to meet everyone. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for inviting me. And uh, so, my name is uh, Quinn Dupont. I'm an assistant professor at uh, the School of Business at University College Dublin. And my, um, my background is actually pretty broad. Um, as was just mentioned, I do have uh, training in uh, sort of very traditional philosophical thought. Um, so I, I, bring, I bring that, that lens to some extent. I've been researching uh, crypto. I mean, back when it was just Bitcoin since 2012. And um, so I've, I know the space fairly well. I've sort of um, been through the trenches and seen it all. And um, it constantly surprises and amazes me. So I'm here um, not so much as a, you know, as, as an expert, um, rather, I like to think of myself more maybe as a kind of a witness. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to sort of be part of the, you know, to participate, do a little particip participation kind of, um, with, uh, you know, help out wherever I can with whatever insights I might have with respect to ethics and these kinds of things. I, I did publish a, an article, um, on the topic, uh, last year and, uh, the first issue of crypto economic systems journal and, uh, where I just put out some of my initial thoughts on the matter, but I'm also just really interested in kind of understanding how you guys, um, tackle these kind of questions. And, and, and so I'm a bit, a bit of like an anthropologist in, in that regard. So thanks. Thanks for having me here. Thank you. So, uh, and from, from the others, um, I don't know uh, if you wanted to share um, anything between last time and now <coughs> you also just uh, joined uh, Nathan. Um, else I will be sharing the screen. Please use the, the moment if you want to um, share any anything from last time we should be looking into. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so right now uh, I would say we have the um, uh, token engineering commons uh, working group omega uh, group right um, so the um, the backgrounds of the people uh, here is more of the political science um, and and uh, philosophy side and with the um, uh, focus group last time uh, we also had um, pretty engineering heavy uh, side of the token engineering or this crypto economics uh, flower. And um, so there were two things that uh, I thought were quite interesting and I wanted to actually prepare this so it's a bit uh, easier on the eye uh, and uh, you, but um, there were two things um, 
especially in the chat. Uh, chats are always the best. So one was from Aiden, basically. Um, it's about this drive to re-engineer uh, current or existing um, value flow or value systems that established with the big corporates and so on and so forth and our ability to um, you know, programmable value networks, we engineer that and actually question the ethics of the current system and start from there. So I've thought uh, that is uh, super interesting. Do you, um, and I would say, um, please don't hesitate to uh, share um, if you see that as a pattern, if you resonate with that, um, and and don't be shy. <laughs> so, um, or um, if you want me to clarify what I saw, like this whole. Um, Data, data ownership, are we the consumers being, you know, uh, zapped into on the internet in this data economy? Or uh, are we going to have this participatory networks, ownership of our data, you know, uh, my key, my data, and also re-engineer all of these, uh, that's those systems. And he gives the um, very placative example of media. Um, and data and social networks, etc. I assume, but <laughs> but um, I think it goes for um, quite other established networks as well, even for utility networks like energy versus decentralizing energy systems, where we have more participatory. I don't want to monopolize. I'm, I'm new here. So, um, I, but I, I mean, I, I have lots of thoughts on this. <laughs> so I, I, I agree. Um, I think that's both the, the exciting and dangerous part of uh, token engineering um, and crypto more generally <clears throat> is that it's uh, perhaps one of the first time where we've had such a powerful set of technologies to re-engineer um, society and, and the values that um, we utilize in society. And um, I, I noticed in the chat, Zargam had pointed to, he, he mentioned um, the, the, the G word governance. And, and I think that's, but governance is really just the, I, I like to think of it as the um, sort of friendly term that is um, really masks, really what is just amounts to ethics and values and norms. Um, and it's the how we and how we how we adjust those. The only other kind of term I've been using recently is I think very much of token engineering as a form of behavioral technology. And this goes back to some good old fashioned research out of, um, from the 19, you know, 1950s and stuff. Um, famous but made made famous by bf skinner and uh you know um behavioralism has has been of course uh, uh attacked um sort of for, for lots of philosophical reasons or whatever but uh i think the difference between what bf skinner was doing with his rats and his, and his cages and giving them cocaine to dope themselves with or whatever and, and whatever all kind of crazy um uh, experiments he was doing the difference between then and now is that we've got computers and platforms specifically really <clears throat> that there are these, these network platforms that are vastly more powerful and persuasive than could have ever even been imagined at that time. So that's that whole, everything from kind of the world of media down to the uh, micro interactions that can be programmed down to um, a token engineering platform. So yeah. that's, I mean, I, as I said, I've lost a thoughts about this, but I, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I, I'm I just also here. just, uh, no, thank you. So first of all, we're all new to this. So uh, thank you for just uh, breaking uh, the, the ice, if you will. And I, I'm sure we'll figure out uh, and get to a, a rhythm. 
but that's exactly um i think what today should be like capturing more uh, of okay which direction should we look uh, into and again i think that's exactly that part like this whole token economy literally this uh, uh phrase is uh, coined by skinner who was basically treating institutionalized uh, schizophrenia patients to change or, or adapt their behavior to cope uh, with um, um yeah uh, social environments and the good side kind of goes into you know uh, utopia uh, we're going to be able to self-govern self-sovereignty and we're going to use this technology to actually uh there is a super nice saying of andy to um self-sovereign individuals govern well together but it's assumed this whole self-sovereignty part like uh, that we are not going to be the ones uh, that are going to be manipulated on massive scale, right? This uh, reward system on a global uh, coordination um, infrastructure. So that's, um, yeah, that's the you know, black and white, uh, uh, good and bad uh, kind of uh, seeing it. Mm. So are we are we talking about the ethics of this as well? Um, so yeah, this is basically how it starts at right? um, you know questioning the ethics of the current system, how how this is handled, then saying web three is the uh, savior and we basically have that opportunity but also uh, naively maybe not taking into account that this is behavioral technology uh, and could turn into um, yeah yeah I, I fall in that realm where I'm like you know I, I you know he, he talks about here the, the media propagation the one consciousness but you know uh, I think because this is a behavioral technology that we're just bootstrapping the same, you know, moral system uh, with better tech and, and better tools to actually use that for um, behavioral control. And, you know, while we may increase the cost of it, I don't think we get of that ethical dilemma at the heart of it. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, I, yeah, that, I guess that would be my only concern in terms of ethics is that, you know, we, we're, we're, we're just bootstrapping the same system with better tooling and and yeah. why you can reward people that's fine but you're still controlling them and there's a baseline ethical problem there that needs to be solved to where the people who are participating need to be able to opt in mm -hmm. and and no rights um and we will get to this like we also said um but we will get to that in in the mirror one in in one second like people need to be able to opt in. So actually get a handle on this potential else. If you're a passive user, it's not something good. <laughs> so um, the, where was the other one? And Nathan basically, um, I'm sorry, um, here. Actually, the second part uh, that um, drew me in the chat was uh, what you said, uh, Nathan, especially in the beginning. Um, the difficulty right uh, here um, that the ethical dilemmas uh, emerge from rigid institutional ethics where autonomy of the individual is replaced by the collective uh, determination of what's good and bad and uh, you know even the assumption of uh, that there is uh, easily identifiable things uh, to start with and this is basically where we said um, or already are feeling like it's contextual ethics, uh, how are we going to actually contextualize the things and not just we, the engineer, the designer,
but every participant, so we have this uh, various perspectives of every individual, uh, idealistically. And then at the end, uh, you basically do ask, do we have anything resembling the ethical code uh, of conduct? So we, we want guidance, and this is the whole thing, Like, but at the same time, uh, and I agree with you totally, like starting with this is uh, token engineering ethics, uh, or we have our ethical code of conduct. And then, and then what? <laughs> A, it is very difficult uh, to um, impossible, uh, probably. And B, um, it might give false safety where we should be actually questioning, contextualizing uh, every decision. Would you like to add add something there? Like mm, again, I'm, something. Uh, I'm, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that uh, that having a TE ethical code of conduct, uh, you know, having standards and procedures and codes of conduct are extremely important for just having something to reference. So I think that is a, a very foundational document, similar to a covenant or a, you know your mission, vision, value type type of. Uh, document your constitution if you will that you know people can reference as like these are these are the code of conducts for token engineers and this is something that we can all reference no matter what type of project you're working on and i think it's very important to develop but it, it, like you said it, <laughs> it it's not end all be all we have to set up a system where we continue to question it but um without a code of conduct it's very hard to enforce ethical uh rules and and, and you know not become kind of dogmatist type of situation. So just my thoughts. And I was actually super happy um, to have found IEEE. Matt, please um, don't have to raise a hand, <laughs> jump in. I was actually thinking about while I was reading the tech documents on contextual ethics. We should also question to what extent we should think about ethics as contextual ethics, like with these classical uh, criticism of moral relativism. I think we also may, may, we should also think about actually in order to build a, let's say, common ethical ground for all people. So I think even though ethics is relative and it's changed in context to some extent, but for my perspective, for example, where I born, wearing hijab is perfectly common thing and it's nothing serious threat to morality, etc. But in Sweden, people were talking about maybe we should ban it or not. So of course there is like, this is not a good example, but it just popped up to my mind. So <laughs> there is like relativist uh, part of ethics, but also maybe we should think about, for example, this is from Noam Chomsky. Uh, he, he, in one of his interview, he said, of course there is changing part of ethics. He's a moral objectivist. So he said, it's, it's impossible to deny it. So it's a scientific truth. Like we observe it, we see it. But to some extent, we, we how we acquire like ethics culture is actually be a biological domain of us so even though we have some variety of ethics so there should be some common ground he argues as as close to his like theory of universal grammar theory we acquire ethics through same way without like any discrimination to any people in world so for example, he gives the example of, for, uh, even though a lot of moral relativists argue that since ethics is changing, it's not a biological domain, he argued that a lot of uh, human system actually are changing through our experience. For example, he gives the example of visual system. So through our like childhood memories, etc., the conception of vertical and horizontal is changing in each people. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that you can change some pe person's visual system to insect's visual system. So there is a range of options to 
biological systems, but at the end, there is some sort of common ground maybe we can talk about. Ethics is a different kind of thing, so it's hard to study com compared to visual system, let's say. But maybe while we are talking about or discussing about contextual ethics, maybe we can also incorporate some of the moral objectivist argument, like how we should think about it and how it can be, let's say, something practical, unlike current philosophical discussion of moral objectivism. Mm -hmm. That's, that was my point. Actually. Yeah, and that's basically also the, the more philosophical view. I think would be great if we had this this group that you know grows and actually can follow what is happening, and then you know uh, help us get the philosophy of this. Right, assuming that it is really something uh, new emerging um, in our digitalizing, globalized, but uh, highly connected uh, societies or communities. Um, I think it's super important. I, I, that discussion is definitely going to uh, continue and just this you know 10 minute uh, wrap up on those like what is the the framework we can mm, use to have the practical discussions um is a big one so i hope you feel inclined to uh continue or share uh, more of this i am just capturing the keywords that uh, i and hopefully others use to to research uh, further and maybe uh, I have not read it fully, but um, Gies uh, intervened or, or jumped into the discussion after I shared the IEEE ethics standard document. <laughs> and, um, you know, basically, roughly, um, uh, he's coming from an entirely different uh, perspective. Um, again, you know, okay, engineers turned uh, value inquiry into a, a flow model, like uh, are, you're using those simplistic tools again, <laughs> kind of don't. Uh, and I will um, go into this uh, more, but um, I think it's this um, challenge or the tension that uh, both attracts us uh, as well as, you know, challenges us is this we are engineering information systems, you know, uh, definitely like that's super clear uh, on the practical deployment side, but those systems are uh, interacting uh, in this, this human uh, social sphere, uh, in this mind sphere. Um, and basically this whole token uh, meaning that this representation of information can and will be used to guide, inform, or uh, incentivize actions. There are people basically um, will decide, am I following these incentives? There are people who decide, uh, am I designing these incentives? Uh, what are my intentions? And, and so on and so forth. So, um, And maybe now I would really also add uh, to that Noam Chomsky um, and this behavioral and biological um, lens, really also Sapolsky, like how do we as humans uh, think we make decisions uh, and our knowledge of it, at the very least right now, is definitely not that simplistic uh, models that have been used until now to inform our economic systems that we live in and to our, inform our policy making that we live in. So our chance is really to make use of this um, mm, 
I'm just taking note. So make use of these. Um, knowledge about our um, as human agents, uh, about our decision-making capabilities and incap incapacities. Uh, and um, make that visible and also make uh, use of technology to help us at the very least be more aware of those you know, be it as a designer or be it as a participant. That, that, that seems for me like the, <laughs> uh, how do you call it, the, the easy way out kind of, uh, you know, it's practical. The best we can do is, you know, consilience the state of the art knowledge about uh, decision making, combine it with uh, tooling that helps uh, everyone taking part in a token economy. Can you? Yeah, this, uh, um, sorry. Yeah, if, if I can quickly share something now that you're talking about capabilities, I think since uh, we are exploring and we've used Ostrom's principles, uh, Nobel Prize in economics, there's another Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, Amartya Sen, and I think the, the capability approach is uh, a very interesting thing that we ought to be uh, at least considering more. So uh, for those that don't know, the capability approach uh, basically investigates how to contemplate the value of freedom in the context of the distributed justice and economic philosophy. And recently there was uh, a book that actually comes up with a, uh, um, it's called the ethics and economics of the capability approach. And uh, it comes up with, a, with a, an, an equation to sort of value uh, the capabilities of, of an individual, right? So sense concept of freedom relates to, to capabilities or like real potentialities for what individuals can actually do or be by using the resources, right? Um, so instead of, instead of just, uh, focusing on commodities, uh, we can think of, of actually functionings and capabilities, right? So going beyond capturing well-being by GDP, uh, and commodities, but actually functionings and capabilities, uh, and doing this would have renewed definitions of difference, equality, opportunity, et cetera. Uh, basically I, I don't want to get too much in the weeds of it, but uh, the way the way the author does the economic modeling of individual capability is by formulating it as an extended maximization model uh, in economics. Uh, so instead of instead of just having an, a commodity space, which is a traditional way, uh, comes up with a, a, a functioning space. Uh, so I mean, these things it's 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 really too intricate to to explain in just, and I don't want to uh getting mm -hmm. the conversation but um, i'm happy to do some more research and and come up with something maybe a forum post uh um but but yeah it's just food for thought and if anyone is interested in that i can share uh the knowledge i just thought it was a great way forward that actually they came up with an, uh, an equation for it uh and if there's a like an economic equation for it then of course we can model it and maybe do some token engineering around it so uh, these two things intersect, and we ought to be paying attention. So, uh, sorry, Quinn, um, go ahead. No, I, 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 um, I think that was that was very helpful. I, I, I don't really actually have anything to to add. Um, my only my only thought was simply that there's this distinction that perhaps we need to be mindful about, of which is. Um, whether or not ethics is something beyond um, just right action. Um, but actually I think the capability model is, is a really great example of a way of uh, finding a, the, you know, that a way, the way through that um, otherwise uh, problematic, somewhat problematic division. So it's, it's that kind of thinking that I think is, is really um, useful. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great suggestion. Mm -hmm. Cool. So 
again, like it would be great if you would um, take this document also and just add uh, links uh, to, to um, the parts that you have been uh, contributing so people can look it up or feel free to uh, really add a paragraph or more. Um, because I think we definitely need um, the, this like, what are the different uh, frameworks, different models, uh, and and then also have people to actually um, interested, invested, and and uh, willing to uh, follow, right? These these models and how they map into our um, um, token engineering space. Or I would really extend this to participation in token economies because one thing I and again um, I'm curious about the capability approach uh, Manu because one thing I would like to and I think we will have to uh, let go of is kind of um, it's the engineer's job uh, and they will take care of uh, you know um, making those ethical decisions and uh, you know, I'm just a consumer, and um, I am protected by uh, laws and what have you. Because it seems like we're moving beyond that, right? Uh, we're mu moving beyond that um, consumerism, um, passive user, basically uh, who needs pro protection and um, to actually um, self sovereign peer participants in these networks. Um, the token engineering commons uh, stated very early because it was more or less obvious, like uh, also a wake up call maybe, uh, you know, your economy, your choice, meaning this is a token engineering commons or token engineers. Uh, Right, uh, like if someone should participate, it's you, <laughs> kind of. Um, so that that's one thing, um, I guess. Um, really, how do we move um, beyond these 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 roles and um, uh, power and responsibility? And it's the engineer's job to actually, uh, yes, these are participatory networks um, of peers and um, and each participant is basically um, making decisions that are defining the token economy uh, as well as the initial design. So some, uh, yeah, just to make uh, or underscore this, uh, it is, I believe, very important to have these frameworks follow on. Um, the other part of this is really um, people in the trenches, <laughs> uh, 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 practical life of a token engineer looks really very, very different. It's just you, you're a software engineer fixing bugs uh, on a live uh, system. And for example, one thing uh, uh, from the ivory tower uh, of token engineering, it's like, oh, you know, model and simulate and do all these safe uh, practices. Um, and, you know, I, I was the first to say, you know, you don't test in prod, like, you know, <laughs> where are we? But, because um, the system is really a live system. It is, it's a really cyber physical uh, thing, uh, an organism. You can't test everything. And even if you test everything uh, in production, conditions come together, you could have never foreseen you could have never entirely, you know, uh, modeled uh, and and um, tested. Like it's not uh, engineering a machine, 
uh, or a power system. It's dynamic, but it's still man-made and only operated uh, by other machines and uh, protocols. Our token networks aren't that. <laughs> right now, they're certainly not uh, that, but it's more um, a living, uh, again, uh, a living organism that's only partly engineered. Um, and that's basically, um, again, pushed me towards, and I'm curious about uh, what you think about how Essex is handled in, in places where you can't uh, research everything in a Petri dish, uh, where you need to experiment, uh, you know, um, and test. Uh, for example, this with humans uh, and so on. So are, are we more in that space? I think, um, I don't know. I felt token engineering commons is pretty safe because it's a very niche uh, community, right? And with the trusted seed and everything, it was very, um, how do you call it? Um, concise, coherent, uh, and participants know what they're doing and, and uh, supporters, contributors know what they're doing and why. So that was uh, pretty clear, but when I look into um, any other <laughs> uh, um, thing that went live uh, in the past years and also just recently the whole DeFi protocol, protocol as well as the um, um, Sorry. Yeah, the DeFi, uh, as well as even NFT, um, it's very different. So is there any resonance, uh, for example, or any insights? Um, I don't know, Quinn or others, if you know or are knowledgeable um, about this experimentation side and the ethics of, of that and whether there are also um, more, more practical things we could uh, look into that isn't just systems engineering um, and I oh. mm -hmm. So my, um, my thought on that would be, I, I just draw this from a lot of my uh, ethical research is on computer security more broadly speaking. And in computer security, there's this distinction between um, when you're doing network uh, uh, testing between active and passive measurement mm -hmm. and passive measurement is that kind of naturalistic sort of uh, inductive kind of approach, right? Like almost that kind of what we typically think of as science, right? Um, you're just looking for, um, to observe some uh, behavior or phenomena and you record it and, and then you, you know, come up with a hypothesis about what's going on or whatever, right? That's sort of how we typically think most science kind of goes. Um, in computer security research, that's certainly that is one option is you can just sort of do passive measurement and just, just see what the network's up to. And, and okay, that's, you know, there's a big distinction though with some people who do active measurement, which is really um, a form of inducing the behavior that they're looking to, um, to sort of see what happens as it were, right? It's a kind of that, um, you know, put it in the Petri dish. I mean, you were using these words before about this, this idea of like, is this really, is this just a, a something we can just sort of muck with or whatever, because it's mm -hmm. a sort of a live system or whatever. Um, and that scene in that, in, in the computer security space is much more dangerous and, but nonetheless is a, a, a significant part of what com, uh, computer security researchers do. So it is seemingly accepted, mm -hmm. but um, there's loads and loads of uh, examples that have backfired um, from people doing active active measurement. So I definitely think that's one of those, it's like the, I don't know what the metaphor would be, but um, the trip line or, or, you know, danger, beware or something like that is, is part, it should be sort of surrounding anything that's um, not seen as just purely passive. Mm -hmm. That would be super interesting if you could uh, share some of those, like when, when you have time and... Yeah, I, I'll, if I can think of some, uh, but there, are, like I say, there are many examples of, of yeah. these kind of uh, situations going, going wrong with, with active yeah. measurement. Mm -hmm. 
super cool like even if you just say okay uh, you know uh, throw a couple of phrases uh, across the fence so we can uh, um, know what to look for and yes so computer security i'm sure we i'm also looking for you know who, who should we have in the next uh, focus group kind of uh, maybe it's um people from other um, domains um, and then exchange with their, you know, find similar situations like in the first group and ask um, how, for example, uh, the, someone in computer security would or uh, has experienced similar situations and how do they handle it, uh, you know, ethical code of conduct or um, find, find parallels um, and or really bring people together from, you know, DeFi, NFT. Um, it have increased the list uh, that we have here a bit more. Um, yeah, so if uh, you guys I, have suggestions. Yeah, if I, if I can share something too. Um, I don't know really how to uh, frame this, but I've been in this sense of uh, experimentation for ethics and decision making. I think we're in a in a realm in the crypto space where we've been where we've been putting a lot of um, a lot of different aspects of the self together that weren't uh, combined before. And I really like the perspective of us being like whole human beings coming to uh, spaces where we can express our full selves instead of uh, just little parts of us that um, interact with one thing or another. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, I mean, I was a performer before I, I got to this space and my object of research was sexuality for a long time. And I've been um, really interested about how uh, desire and our relationship with sexual ethics play on decision-making in, in all levels, not only uh, when it comes to like specific sexual interactions, but thinking of this energy as um, this pulse of motivation that it's like our whole body, our whole selves and parts of how we interact with the world. And I was reading this book that uh, made the, the biggest research in America about desire, um, the most like data-based uh, look into, into desire, motivation, sexuality and politics. And, and how they interplay together. And there was a lot of clusters of like uh, data patterns between like people that had certain types of desires and certain types of uh, political stances and how that affects and the way they make decisions in the day by day. And I feel like it's still a taboo to talk about this in the crypto space, but uh -huh. is somehow um, a little more open than any other space. And mm -hmm. I think if it's if we are in this experimentation field and we're talking about ethics and consent and legitimacy, it's really like foundational to me to think about sexuality as well. Cool. So also like, underneath desires, uh, needs, etc. That's this whole uh, full selves, like our decision making is not uh, just rational, it's uh, literally goes to, you know, things that conditions the second back, uh, an hour back, a year back, 100 years back, and so on and so forth. So um, definitely. And also, Again, what would be really cool is if we find those patterns, even those, again, coming from widely different directions, if we find that 
grain of truth or the ground truth. If you find such a pattern, then I would say, okay, you know, it seems to be a really interesting thing to, to put into the middle of, of this. And, you know, the, um, I think Nathan said common ground, right? So I don't think it will be broad as a ground, but maybe as a grain. And that would be even, even enough. Like also going back to, to first principles. I think if we have one principle that's that literally or two, it's uh, full spectrum, as much as many perspective uh, as we can get. And then basically uh, find that grain that exists or that pattern that exists, no matter from what wild direction you come and look at this, that would be fantastic. In the meantime, people are dying, <laughs> deploying token networks. <laughs> it's really crazy. So, uh, but uh, again, I think this whole um, frame, how are we looking at this? It's uh, very, very exciting side of it. And um, we need to, take it along and hope you're all motivated to really bring bring everything you got. Um, and on the other side, again, at the very least, we have uh, more and more experience. People are, uh, you know, sharing their experiences. That's great um, in a very transparent uh, way uh, without drama, like this is what it is. Uh, and that's also very um, exciting, actually, <clears throat> to have people um, who are developing. To accept them? Yes. Go ahead. So, sorry, I just, I just wanted to, to ask a question because uh, what Olivia said really um, kind of just uh, resounded with me, like uh, in terms of how we approach ethics, because traditionally or the ethical frameworks that we do use are, are designed around professions. Uh, professional like the IEEE is a great example of that. However, in the DAO space in particular, and with token economies, we have a lot of people who, you know, like with this postmodern uh, world that we live in, the pluralization of society and, and this blend of like personal and uh, work has really changed the game of ethics to expand to the individual in terms of, you know, these conflicting values almost and to do the current ethical frameworks that we're currently using take that into account yeah i don't think so <laughs> that um i think we've been living in a very simplistic system and models and i think we're outgrowing them so this is how how it feels it's more like if you look back how society organized, what were the social norms, what kept things together, uh, you look at it and you, you see it from a, another level, from more experiences and so on. It feels like we're just expanding a little bit more, uh, seeing more dimensions and hopefully uh, be able to level up uh, to, to handle this. Um, um, yes. And I agree, like uh, we should, and again, uh, <laughs> maybe I am too biased there, but I don't see anything that captures what we're doing. And it would be great um, if know. we can capture that or, or yeah. Um, I, I would just like to say, I think these last two comments have been, I think they're really interesting and generative because this is not the first time I've heard in these kinds of discussions, people being really aware of the kind of embodied um, sense of, of just of being people and making decisions and so on and so forth. And that includes things like sexuality and you know race and um, economics and so on and so forth. All these all these kinds of things, um, which is where we are and so on and, and whatnot. But What's interesting, and, and so I just love, would love to hear people talk more about this and to see if this is maybe, like if this is maybe something that this space is embracing or if this is just a, a kind of a one-off or something like this. Because in many respects, the sort of very traditional um, 
the very traditional approach to uh, to crypto is it has this legacy of the kind of the sort of cyber libertarian, which it um, very much downplays the embodied self. Um, and so there's so it's, there seems to be ha- there has to be a kind of a form of resistance against this if it's going to get anywhere. Um, this this kind of embodied uh, kind of ethics or whatever, and I'm really supportive of that. I think that's actually right for a whole bunch of reasons, not just for like because we're people or whatever, but also I think there's like f- sort of deeper philosophical reasons why this is um, something that's right, and that's something that the, sort of the um, early cyber libertarians um, kind of in many respects got wrong. Um, but I think it's 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 a it's a point of content contestation, right? That we have mm-hmm. to really. It, it, and it's it's not clear. It's and I, it almost seems to me like there might be something of a sea shift happening here. That there's just certain values that these communities are working through in a ways that maybe actually the rest of society is not really up to speed on yet. So I don't. That's just but to say was, that I yeah, think it's something really, that needs to be um, yeah, sort of I, I really agree. kept in mind. I, I agree, but at the same time, it feels like um, we are rest of society like if you look where people are coming from it's very hard to say okay uh so i think that's the that that's one question and maybe we are uh, a bit more biased but when i look at uh things like metagame for example again entirely different backgrounds so if you want demography or, or what have you um still seeing this uh thing and I come from um, automation automate all the things uh, you know if computers run stuff it will be better to actually yeah, me, growing clear, I mean, into um, this huh? I don't mean professional all the gate like professional origins of where people I mean much more um, across the board and you know I, I, I mean that's just my suspicion if I had to give a, a, a root cause of this would be a generational shift um, that there's um, uh, basically millennials and Gen Z is who have now populate the crypto space. And um, with that, they bring, a, uh, roughly speaking, a new kind of ethics. Yeah. That's Could if I had to just make it just a, a, a off the, you know, whatever yeah. kind of guess as to as, as where this is coming from. Yeah. So that's also one aspect, uh, if you have ideas how we could actually um, create a frame and how we capture this information. Um, I didn't record this one because I thought maybe we can open, uh, be more open, uh, etc. But mm, I mean, if I was an anthropologist, <laughs> you know, I would, I would I'd probably uh, delve into this. I think it's super interesting what is what is coming together and also the willingness of people to really uh, collectively figure figure it out uh, and be super open-minded about you know um, another thing that I keep hearing is uh, transcending paradigms uh, so that's literally seems to be things that resonate like um, yeah I know I come from uh, a certain viewpoint but uh, we're inquisitive and with every question and every experience um, it open up it opens up so um, but maybe uh, maybe we are um, or at the very least Omega might be biased uh, towards this but from experience I can say it wasn't some it, it evolves or for me personally, it's evolved. I don't know um, how about the others. Like if you just see your, um, see something resonant or if you also have to have a couple of mind shifts, step changes by, uh, on my side, I must say. So, um, okay, um, we're, um, approaching the hour again as always i think it's uh, quite short it's the hour when it starts to become more interesting <laughs> maybe uh, i'll try maybe we can do uh, one and a half hours 
uh, but at the same time, we could also have a break here um, and um, I, I give you a short overview of uh, how this was or how this came together or what, what patterns uh, it seems or what practical things we could extract from this um, these notes of the first focus group. Um, again, like what type of decisions have been uh, have we been making and what type of dilemmas, not even ethical, uh, but what type of dilemmas uh, we are experiencing. It's very hard to um, have people exactly answer this and I don't think that's uh, ever possible. But what came comes up is um, making things understandable for everyone, even for oneself when things are evolving, uh, you're designing the token economy, things are deploying uh, versus getting things done. It's really a software system uh, you can and people expect uh, to be delivered as a software system. <laughs> so um, uh, there's this and on the other side, we, we are we are well aware we're creating a reward system, incentive system that may will influence the decision of others, how they participate. And um, we don't even know ourselves. Uh, we can model, etc., but we need uh, some sort of feedback system that is better than I have modeled and simulated. Uh, uh, and, and now we are just uh, deploying it out in the open. So again, um, you know, better mapping, but also checking the beliefs and systems and worldviews. There are some things uh, uh, I can share more next time, maybe, or when we go into actually making something out of this. But there are some mm, things we've been using to um, map. This isn't just multi-stakeholder, but really multi-aspect situation. Uh, feedback system with, with technology data analysis and so on. How far can we get with those? Um, what are the levers there? So uh, again, it's a blend of philosophical and, and humanistic side of things with um, creme de la creme, uh, machine learning and, and uh, simulation stuff. Information availability, accessibility, uh, versus, you know, the bias of the engineer that uh, seems more of a topic uh, beyond even token engineering. Mm, but then there's this typical thing uh, we, we want to uh, privacy versus the bland uh, transparency of um, tokens and token networks and also how this participation goes. So there's actually um, in my view, very little privacy uh, in, in how things are run. And then um, on the other side, there is really regulators asking of you to do KYC and so on without actually um, having this deep uh, and, and tested system of how do we keep the balance between the, the transparency that we need uh, the things that we engineer to increase that uh, traceability of individuals versus wallets and so on, uh, at the same time uh, preserving the privacy of participants. Mm, again, I guess we will find, or when I looked at IEEE, for example, many topics uh, um, find themselves there again. And then also like this misuse of access to information. Uh, if you're uh, on the designing side of the token network, <clears throat> again, that's something. Um, there are best practices or, or experiences from other professions, uh, be it investment banking or um, yeah, mostly investment banking, for example. Um, one thing that came out, um, was this uh, or this insight? Um, okay, information access to power, uh, access to information is power, and so on. And now we are basically moving that from the board or the economic. Uh, do you remember the quants being called in the financial uh, or in the Wall Street, uh, being called the princes of the universe? Quants. 
because they're running the uh, money system. Now it's moving towards uh, the token engineer people able to deploy these contracts, uh, right? But the game doesn't change. It's like changes hands. And at first it feels liberating. Of course, if you're the coder now, basically, you know, uh, or if you're basically um, a renegade from the existing financial system and now you're a coder, you can basically run uh, Wall Street from, uh, um, yeah, with your laptop wherever you are. <laughs> um, so that uh, information asymmetries um, are still there, power asymmetries and so on. And um, that type of ethical concern I think uh, one very concrete thing that is coming out of token engineering is uh, computer edit governance uh, that adds really every participant so that um, such decision making will really be enabled by every participant. Um, that could be compared to liquid democracy. Uh, visions, you know, everyone participates and, and every decision made for the society goes back to every individual. Uh, that seems to be similar to that kind of ideal. And the question is whether we do have now better tools um, 